So thank you guys all so much for having me today. It's a real honor to come and speak with you all today. I thought I'd take a moment, uh, you know, since I, I don't know everyone in the group, to give you just a little bit of background on who I am and who my company, SSP Innovations, is within the industry. And also, you know, maybe my, I have a personal tie to Memphis at this point and, uh, and uh, would like to maybe elaborate on that. You know, as I look back to when I started in GIS, and everybody's got their own story about where they started in GIS, mine was in 2000, and I was an uh, application developer uh, working in South Florida. Uh, grew up in Tampa, uh, went to school in Gainesville, and uh, doing transactional based website development, uh, reading and writing web development, you know, building websites. And uh, if I'm totally honest with you guys, when I first got assigned uh, out to move to Colorado and, and work on GIS, uh, I had no idea what it stood for. And I had to go Google it. I, maybe it wasn't Google back then, but I had to search it online. It was probably Yahoo, right? Uh, I had to Yahoo it to find what GIS stood for and do some research on it so that I had some semblance of what I was getting into. So I came into it from that application development front uh, and really learned what GIS was from, from the outside in. Uh, but it, it, it proved two important things to me at the time. And I wonder if any of this resonates with you all uh, as GIS professionals. Uh, the first was compared to, to standard application development, building websites, banking, whatever applications, the geospatial aspect of building systems was really, really interesting. Taking problems and challenges and utilizing them in a geospatial context uh, brought whole new life to solving problems, to writing algorithms, to uh, taking business problems and workflow challenges. And, and figuring out a way to solve those in a different way. So that was, a, I really counted as a blessing in my career to have gotten into that early uh, in many years now looking back uh, to have found a really place that I, th I thrive and love to work within because of that aspect. The other interesting thing I, I think looking back over time is that, uh, you know, in 2000 we had the, the dot-com bust, maybe not everybody in the room remembers that, but big bust in the market kind of tanked and we kind of built back and we had the Great Recession. Uh, and I wonder if this is true for you too, but I found that GIS was a pretty good place to be in the market through all those years. It was seemingly to constantly thrive, grow, and build upon itself where uh, other markets in general IT might have uh, not done as well. So combining those two things, I found GIS to be a particularly uh, interesting and, and a good place to be in for my career. Uh, if we fast forward a few years, I had an opportunity to start SSP Innovations uh, in 2007. I started in 2003, but took it full time in 2007. And uh, that was a real great opportunity to start doing what we've loved to do through all those previous years, uh, sort of in a new way, engaging with customers in a new way. Uh, soon thereafter, uh, my tie to Memphis came about. And uh, about a year and a half in or so, we had an opportunity to partner with another larger company to uh, bid on a job here at Memphis Lake Gas and Water. And uh, this was, uh, again, a sort of a two-pronged, really important thing for us. Uh, the first was that for a small company to have an opportunity to come in and work with a, a utility like MLG and W, uh, that was pretty exciting. It was a big contract for us, multi-year. Uh, we're still working with them today through another many different sets of projects over the years. But to have that opportunity was great. Uh, you know, secondarily, to come out and meet some of the folks that I've met, and, and now over these, uh, it's hard to believe uh, that it's been seven years. Uh, it started that in October of 2008. Uh, but some of the folks that I've met are some of the best people I've worked with in this industry. And I mean that from the bottom of my heart. I, I work with folks across the nation every, every week. And the, the people I've met here and worked with, built relationships with, many of them in this room today, uh, I've had long-term friendships. And uh, maybe it's a tie back to my, uh, my youth in Florida, but it, it really feels like a good quality of Southern folk that, uh, that we don't get as much out in Colorado. So uh, I'm truly blessed and honored to be here to speak with you today about a topic that I am uh, very passionate about, and that is GIS, where we've come from, and specifically where we're headed today and into the future. So again, thank you all for having me, and uh, uh, we'll go ahead and dig in here. So we look back a little bit of history. We always have to look back to know where we're headed, right? Mapping used to be cartography. Uh, who in the room worked on paper maps at some point in time? All right, all right, so we got some, some out there. Everything originated with paper maps. We've got plenty of utilities out there that may still use them. You know, it's come a long way. Obviously, GIS is an evolution of that. They're usually the source for a conversion of maps. This is an interesting picture I just found last week to replace this screenshot. I was out working in Burbank, and this was a picture, and it's been retired as like a historical document. And I thought that was kind of neat, 1927. But it wasn't retired until 2006. 
okay? And you, you know, you're familiar with this, and uh, many of you can read these, right? You got the main primary coming in. This is electric map. You got tra transformers. You got distribution and service points. But this was the way business was done. This was the origination of our craft long before GIS was a term. So we looked to where GIS turned and became the concept of truly having geographic information systems. And I got this definition straight from Esri, who's our primary GIS partner. A geographic information system lets us visualize, question, analyze, and interpret data to understand relationships, patterns, and trends. And I find this definition useful when we talk about GIS to really break it down and also determine where we've come and where we're going. So for me, utilities, and we work in utilities and telecoms, electric gas, uh, water, telecom, uh, really a great case study, a great example of why GIS matters and the application of GIS to solving geospatial problems. So if you start, you know, break down that definition a little bit. Visualization, right, that's obviously the core. It came from the paper maps. We now do it using technology. Utilities, obviously, map facilities, which creates maps. And at the core, we can now make it accessible via devices. We're not having to pass around paper. We have centralized updates to a, a database-driven system, ideally. Creating better maps. And we still have paper maps. And I imagine many folks in the room still have paper maps. But they're, of course, paper maps produced from digital formats. But we can do that better, faster, and more efficiently than, of course, we did through a hand-drawn perspective. So if we dig into really talking about patterns and trends for analysis, the back end of that, when I think about that in GIS, it's really about driving relationships, because paper doesn't give us too many relationships because there's not enough, uh, there's no technology there to drive it. But when we get into the technological world of GIS, relationships are the foundation for building off of that. And that's what really drives decision making, I believe. And this is not just utility specific, this is at any level, uh, federal, state, local government, uh, environmental, whatever you use GIS for, it's about making decisions and it's about relationships that you can derive from the map that may not exist otherwise in your organization. So we take a look at these. And these are things hopefully you're familiar with, but I think it's good to look and sort of organize thoughts around these. There's three key types of relationships that I often put in place when I talk about GIS. So the first is it's hopefully pretty implied. Everybody usually gets this one. It's database technology, classic relationships, where you're tying two pieces of data together via a primary key, a foreign key. So uh, a customer related to a point on the map. Many customers may be related to a point on the map. Uh, a location to asset details, uh, maybe in another system or inherent to the GIS. Customers to usage. You've always got these relationships and you're familiar with them in a GIS platform when you can select a point on the map and see related objects of information. Of course, that didn't exist in the paper world. So by definition, this foundationally changed what GIS did for us by building a relationship between new points of data in our organization, tying them to a geospatial point on the map. So hopefully everybody's familiar with that one and using it today. The second one is spatial awareness. It creates new relationships that maybe never existed before within our data. So quick example here, it's kind of hard to see, but you get highlighted lights there are a set of gas mains in an area. And the little blue dots there were customers. They had never had used a way to relate customers who might have been geocoded and placed on a map to an address, right? They didn't have a hard database relationship to the gas main. So how are they served? By putting them both onto a map and bringing two disparate data sources together and using buffer or other analytics within GIS, we can now build a new relationship that did not exist before, and that drives a lot of value. This is the case of an outage system where they needed to determine, determine the list of customers to do relay orders so they could automate this in the field. My favorite part about this story with this engagement is that it was a process we said, you know, tell us about the business, tell us about the workflow, what do you do in your jobs to get this data? And when there was an outage, they would get the map from GIS, they would then look at the roads on the map, they would then go to their customer system and plug in the roads and find the different customers based on address, they'd make a list, they would copy and paste into a spreadsheet, and then utilize that to drive a manual process to send these out, print them and send them to the field. And that process for a large outage took, in some cases, uh, a day, certainly hours, to put that together in a, a reasonable way that would provide value. By using GIS to create these relationships and drive the business decision making around that, we took that to minutes, right? And this is not utility specific. We can drive pieces of data in your organization that are from disparate sources. Almost every piece is tied to a map. 
to find new relationships that inherently drive value. So spatial awareness creates relationships. Uh, talking about one call boundaries, right? Your call before you dig, that's always based on a buffer off of facilities in the ground. Easements, if we're talking about parcel management, uh, land management, uh, certainly environmental management, we're talking about protected areas. It's all spatial buffers related to other points on the face of the earth. So that brings us to number three, which is an interesting area, maybe more utility specific. But we found that using networks, and in our case geometric networks, drive yet another form of relationship that did not exist before. So if we're talking in our case electric gas water telecom, we now have a hierarchy. We have a substation that generates power and the tracing of a hierarchy of how that power gets from the substation all the way to your home, to a business. Same thing with water, same thing with uh, certainly uh, gas. And in telecom, we're taking it even more advanced. We're tracking packets of data, which you never really think about being geospatial, but really it's flowing from one point, one device to another device over a very large area on the map. Still a very GIS driven problem. And if we can model that using GIS, we can find new relationships, upstream, downstream, uh, parent-child relationships in these networks. And that concept, again, drives new value that allows us to utilize relationships in the GIS. So again, traditional relationships in the database, buffering, spatial awareness, and networks are sort of the three areas I always hone in on when I'm talking about relationships that provide real value. So these relationships, they drive immediate value. Uh, relationships within the GIS establish, back to the definition, the patterns and trends that allow for that analysis to occur, things we could never have dreamed in in the mapping days on paper. So what we've seen, and, and, and this is probably true across many organizations, but certain, certainly in utilities, uh, you've, your foundation of GIS or capturing data digitally in GIS starts. It usually takes many, many years, certainly the first several years, to establish a level of data quality that will support all of those relationships we just talked about. It's usually not inherent when it gets converted from the paper maps. There's a lot of work, a lot of it manual. Some of it can be automated, and, and that uh, certainly is a benefit. But about building and investing time in there to get a steady state support system that has the data standardized to start with, and then have the systems in place to maintain that data and ensure that it's updated correctly in the context of your business workflows are absolutely critical for this data being utilized. So as we take that the next step of relationships, as a utility matures, or any organization matures, we'll begin relating outward. Everything we've talked about so far is really within the GIS, but what if we take that and look outward? Almost all data says in a utility, but I'd challenge you in any organization, state, federal, local, environmental, wherever you work, think about a piece of data in your organization, and you probably already think this way as GIS professionals, but challenge your organizations to think about it. Almost every piece of data can be geospatially tied to a map to the face of the earth in some form or another. And if we do that, now we're bringing new data sources in, cross-referencing it with the authoritative data we've managed for all of this time. So systems integration is often the next step in a progression of GIS within an organization. And it powers exponential decision making because now we're bringing so many new data points in and cross-referencing them with our foundation for the truth of whatever it is the data that we manage. So, you know, every organization has slightly different priorities around some of these items here uh, listed here. You know, we, we've established many common trends. If we've, we've worked with many different organizations across uh, the U.S. Uh, to really find some common trends. And I'm interested, and I, you know, I'll be around the rest of the day and tonight, to hear what you've done. And especially if you're not in the utility organizations, where have you established these type of integration points and what are the value drivers? Because I, this gets me pretty excited. So like any good GIS professional, if you draw a diagram, I hope you also put GIS at the center of the diagram. Uh, I can't say if it's there in every IT approach, but certainly when we're starting with GIS, we start in the center. One of the very first common things, and this is, uh, this is applicable to utilities, but certainly also to any type of customer or citizen in the, the, the local or government planning area, citizen engagement. There's always a system that manages consumption, users, customers, whatever that is. That's a typical integration point because those people, they exist on the map. They have a premise. They live somewhere. They work somewhere. They perform other activities somewhere. So by passing that information and enabling it geospatially, we can tie it to all of the other data that we have within a system. 
Next one is work management. This applies to city work management, filling potholes, certainly to utilities, inspections, maintenance. Passing workflow, capturing as-built information from the field back into GIS, and even driving capital to design. So planning out new areas for capital to design, which is big dollar, uh, certainly at uh, utilities, and I'm sure everywhere else. And where do you invest your capital dollars? How are they going to be applied? And how are we going to do accounting around that data? So an integration there makes a lot of sense. Next one is distribution planning. This is about growth. We're all in some form of a business, even if we work for a city, right? We're serving customers at some level, and we're worried and focused and passionate about growth within our organizations. And that's here, this is distribution planning. In the context of utility, sure, it's new subdivisions, uh, new load on the system. Uh, if we're talking about you know, other areas, it's about growth and population. We have to have the services to support growth. So by integrating and passing geospatial information, inherently is a foundation for distribution planning, and having information fed back in about how our, whatever it is, business is going to grow, again, makes a lot of sense to do it on a map. Next one is enterprise asset management. This is uh, definitely taking off in the last 10 years. Uh, it's really around the life cycle of managing assets. This could be your trucks that work in the field, uh, your fleet, uh, police, state, local government, utilities, whatever it is, the assets including poles, valves in the ground. These need to be managed. They need to be maintained and inspected on a regular basis, which is also a geospatial issue. Outage management is a really easy one. Uh, for those of you that don't work at the utility, when you call in and you say, my power's out, uh, you have to realize that's a geospatial problem from the very get-go. We're taking your location, tying it to a customer record, finding you on a map, and if you and your three neighbors all have called in, we can pretty accurately predict that we've got an issue on the network. We can dispatch a vehicle to that location, which reduces windshield time and gets your power back on faster. Engineering analysis, this is really about planning, and the engineers in the room will appreciate this gearing towards real life conditions that exist in the field geospatially and driving decision making around building out the assets correctly. Uh, we've all heard the engineering disasters that have occurred in, even in recent years, bridges collapsing and such. This is based on real life data which is tied to the face of the earth. It's a geospatial problem inherently. Next one's weather. Weather is obviously on a map. We see it on the map every day when we turn on the news. But what if you can take that weather and pass it into your operational data, whatever that is, and utilize that for decision making? This is where we're driving to, to have real-time weather and predictive weather tied into our GIS, which again, all about making decisions. <coughs> Document management, everybody's got tons of documentation. Uh, information about your home ownership, your parcel ownership. Information about uh, plats that have been put out there planning, surveys, whatever those, those documents exist somewhere, and many of you might have a document management system at this point where they're indexed and scanned, and that's great. But if you think about it, they're all tied to a point on the map. So what if we now can zoom to an area of the map and see every piece of documented information for all of our applicable history of our organization tied to the map at that location? Again, you're gonna drive and decrease the time to find documents and increase the application of the knowledge from those docs. Really more on the utility side, but AMI and MDM. Now this is a hot topic in Memphis these days, and I'm not here to push a political agenda either way. But if you're following the city of Memphis, uh, there's a, a vote coming up here, I think uh, on the 1st of December around putting new meters in. What do these meters do? They read data in real time and they allow us to, to better manage the network. Why is it geospatial? Well, because the meter's placed at a location on the map, tied into the existing facilities that we're already managing through those other intrinsic relationships. Meter data management's put in place to manage those assets, and it allows us, in the case of talking about an outage again, take the case where you're out of town, uh, you're at work, the power goes out. The power company now knows that your power is out before you even know. They may be notifying you via text message eventually, saying, hey, your power's out, it'll be restored in two hours. Or, you know, maybe it's gonna be out for a while and you need to shift all your, your groceries at a minimum out of the fridge. More importantly, it's gonna be tied back into things like life support. If you've got somebody who's tied to electricity and they have a particular window of time to get that power on, tying this real-time information back to the map to alert the utility and or the other authorities that there's an issue drives life-saving critical problems. And finally, knowing where your, your, your crews or your trucks or your vehicles are in the field at all times. We get a lot of pushback from the field guys on this, don't we, about, you know, they don't want to know, they want, don't want us to know where they, they're working. 
However, we have a lot of value by putting these small devices into each truck and having that data flow real time. We can now associate or plan and assign crews that are closest to whatever event is occurring to that location. We can see progress as work is completed in the field, again inherently geospatial. So I've sort of talked about examples in each one of these areas, but what if you took them all and merged them together and found new business value by drawing them all into a centralized integrated environment? And what I ask you ties them together, the concept is GIS, and that's what you guys focus on. And that's why I believe your jobs in the past and in the future is just critical to enabling business to continue and to expand and grow at the rate that we now expect with the information technology that the internet and mobile devices have brought. So everything I've talked about to this date, right? So the intrinsic relationships, as well as the system integration points. If you said, hey, that sounds really cool. I said, it is really cool. But it's still what I'd consider traditional GIS. And I think many in the room probably are hitting on some of these today. Most of these have been around for the 15 years I've been in the industry. The, the main difference I've seen in, in the year 2000, we were doing a lot of the same integrations, but back then only the largest utilities uh, or customers in the country could afford to do these. And they were millions and millions of dollars. Some contracts like $30 million back then, big dollar stuff. We're doing the same things now for a lot of cooperatives, municipalities, uh, different organizations at a smaller level, even private groups. How? Because the technology has advanced to allow the smaller customers to get a significant return on investment because the price is down, but the value is the same. So if you're intrigued by any of this, there's a lot of value to be realized by simply looking at the existing patterns we've already talked about. It may be traditional, but if you're not there yet, if you're not in a fully integrated system in your back office, there's true value that will drive return on investment. Uh, and in the case of utility, I always tie it back to safety, reliability, and efficiency. And I always say if we've done one of those things or increased one of those things, we've done our job. And MAPS, GIS, make that enabled through and through. So if I had to sum that up, I'd say GIS and many systems within our organizations today are what we call systems of record. Hopefully you've heard that term. A system of record tracks authoritative data and we have different systems for different pieces of authoritative data. But there's a new concept that's emerging. It's not GIS specific. It's really across all of IT. And it's this concept of system of engagement. We'll talk a little bit more about that because this really ties into where the future of this industry is going. It may be challenging, but you know, if you can start thinking this direction, we're headed as an evolution to get there. So how do we transform from a system of record of authoritative data to a system of engagement? We'll start by kind of looking at what a system of engagement is. Content sharing, sharing data, and this doesn't mean the GIS group sharing data, this means your end users, every department in your organization sharing data, creating and sharing maps, and sharing services, and these are map services that can be consumed for derivative works in your organization. The easiest thing, and I've got a couple more bullets here, but to talk about in the context of what a system of engagement might be that everybody understands is Facebook. If you think about Facebook in the context of each of these bullets, what kind of data does Facebook create for us? Very little, if you really put your thought into it, right? Where does the content in Facebook come from? It comes from the individual contributors who are publishing it. How many times do we see that data shared? How many times do we see derivative works off of it? Pretty much all the time. There's value there in the mapping world, too. This drives what we call collaborative technology. This is not us as the GIS gatekeepers publishing out our systemized maps. This is publishing raw data and published in configurable data to be used. Letting the user search and find not a full web map, but components of that data that they can use in their day-to-day -day job. The other trick here is getting toward utilizing lightweight applications against the system, not these behemoth implementations. ArcMap is a behemoth legacy application. Uh, nobody at Esri would argue with us on that. It's a hard to use application. It's not what our end users who are focused on doing their jobs in the business should be using. We need lightweight and focused applications. Turn it back to Facebook. How many application developer companies are out there that build lightweight applications that plug right into Facebook to do something with the data, to publish something, to derive something? Same thing comes with Map. And finally, peer interaction. Obviously, this is the core of Facebook. We all get on and there's a status, there's interaction, there's tagging others, there's organizing content, posting, responding, and enhancing. This is very natural in our personal lives, 
but start to think about what it could be done, what could be done with it in a geospatial context with the map products that we manage in our departments and think about, yes, the authoritative data you have today, but think about every other department within your organization, the data they have, and what if that was posted and allows others to respond and enhance and to interact with it in the context of your authoritative data. You start thinking about new ways of engaging with maps. So this is really the foundation for the future of GIS. The landscape of GIS, it says it's changing, but it's already changed. It's here today. And it's really up to us as the GIS professionals to take this and help build it and take it to the next level. The system is no longer a system of record that sits there. It's now a platform for expanding, which drives it to being a system of engagement. We're still doing, and I want to take this back to the initial definition of GIS that I talked about. We're still mapping, analyzing, managing GIS data. But we're going to do it in new ways, by bringing in new users and engaging with the data in new and powerful ways. So let's talk a little bit more about that. The first one is making our data accessible anywhere. Now, many of you may have some web maps. Maybe some of you have some kind of mobile application that's dispatched to the field. And those are great steps, and we've all used those to get to where we are today. We use desktop, we've gotten the web, maybe some devices. But what we're really talking about is, you know, if I said, where can you access Facebook from? You'd probably say everywhere. You know, if you could pull out your phone and get on Facebook or LinkedIn, any other social-based application, it's on your phone, it's on your tablet, it's on your home PC, it's on your work PC, unless your corporation blocks Facebook, of course. But the point is, it's available everywhere. And that drives the engagement with our users. So we need to figure out a way to get our maps available everywhere across devices. That comes with, of course, authentication. We don't want the data getting into the wrong hands. Authorization, what each user is allowed to see once they're within the mapping context. But with those two key points in play, we need to make this data available everywhere. Powered by services. So we've, we've historically we've had the GIS database. Everything's run off the database. As we make this shift to services, it's posting data points, again, that can be consumed by many different areas of an organization consumed, built off of, derived from. Again, you see how this feeds into the system of engagement. It's both our authoritative data that we host, our utility data, your parcel data, but it's also online content. There's, if, you, if you check this and search for this, there's many thousands of different points on the internet that are really authoritative data points of their own. This could be things like weather data, it could be uh, population data, density data. But even so, you start talking to other regional groups in your area and you'll find that they often have published services too. A lot of times we'll see utilities consuming uh, land-based data from the local counties, especially in a multi-county scenario. How do they get it? Via services. They publish these out and they can be consumed. Again, with authentication and authorization, yes. But the sharing of the data, bringing it together, drives the value. Next point I think is really important and it's underestimated too often. And that's using some form of a content management system. Now that's a term that's been around, CMS has been around a long time. It, you know, when I first saw it, it originated around uh, some technology that was really managing like newspaper sites. You know, you have one source of content, but it was flavored into many different newspaper uh, publications. Same content though, but it looked different. Same thing here. We need to be able to publish that data and manage and organize it in a way that users can have easy access to it. And this is via the concept of a portal. Portal is just a general concept to say it's a landing spot for pieces of information within your organization. I thought portal was a kind of interesting word and I did some just research on it to say, hey, wh wh where did this word portal change from being like a portal into another dimension, right? Or a portal as a doorway into a IT term. And you see the change in the technology uh, context coming around the time of uh, AOL, America Online. Everybody remember that first internet connection? That was the first defined IT portal. Why? Because you could get on AOL, and what'd you have? You had your email, you had news, you had weather, and it was the beginning of a platform to bring user engagement to many different data points through a single location. I remember the first time I logged on and the crazy sound of the modem and thinking, wow, I'm talking to other computers. I mean, that was a pretty amazing thing back then. Now we take it for granted, right, on our phones. But this is the same thing we need to take. It's not prevalent within the GIS community, but that's where we need to get to, exposing our data points so that users can get to it easily. And it's about cataloging it, allowing it to be searched, indexing it, pulled together. What does that allow us to do? It allows us to take maps 
into every other system within your organization. The easy one that I always like to talk about is the Microsoft Office extensions. The fact that you can now take a spreadsheet, could be of whatever, if it has an address. Most of our data might have an address on it, maybe an XY if it's something collected from the field. We know that data is geospatial, but how, how does an end user get that onto a map? If I'm a user who's not a GIS professional, I could take a spreadsheet now, and if I use a portal to connect into my organization's information, I could pull up a utility-based map, see all my electric gas water lines. I could project my set of customers that have had issue X onto the map with the click of a button right inside of Excel. And then again, the concept of a portal, I could take that, I could derive, share, and publish it for other users that might find it useful for their job and or maybe they use it as a starting point for their work. Sharing the data, driving it back through everyday systems, created and foundationally exposed via a portal will drive a system of engagement. So this, you know, Office is one example. We use that because everybody uses Office usually somewhere in their organization. But this is all over. This is IBM Cogno, SharePoint, MicroStrategy, SAP. New companies every day are embracing this pattern in building geospatial extensions into their software. The portal is what's going to allow your data that you've managed for all these years and put the time, the hard work, and the money into to be utilized in that context. At the end of the day, it's really about exposing and creating a system of engagement across our entire organization. We've historically been GIS professionals and we got those requests and we created maps, we published them out for a specific usage. We're now turning to more of a self-serve concept of GIS and that's by taking the data, exposing it like we've talked about here, and taking the professional GIS, we're still important. It does not decrease the importance of professional GIS, but we're engaging everyone else on here, knowledge workers, executives, the top level management, the public, citizen engagement, customer engagement, working anywhere across our entire workforce, enterprise integration and contractors, and many more that I'm sure you can think of, they're all tied into that data, not just for viewing, but for collecting, for deriving, for sharing, and for the peer interaction. And that's how we change the perception, the usage, and that's how we're gonna drive GIS into the future. So the foundation of GIS, of platform GIS, of system engagement, is what we call Web GIS. Web GIS ties right back into the same concept of Portal, and, and I for, forgive me for the folks that aren't Esri based in here, but Esri is a pretty, pretty wide used software platform today, so I'm kind of focused there. But the concepts are the same. So Esri Web GIS, this term which you're going to hear more and more from Esri straight up and all the partners and in the customer community, is driven off of a Portal. Now there's many other terms and that's why I like to take this slide just to take a step back and try and reduce maybe some confusion. I was confused when I first heard them, maybe you have been too. The word portal can mean a couple different things and capitalization becomes important. When you're talking to Esri and they use uppercase portal, it's a product called Portal for ArcGIS. That's a piece of software they can install on your servers that works behind your firewall to manage your data uh, just like you've managed all these other systems in the past. So it's local on-premise. Lowercase portal implies a product called ArcGIS Align. This is a hosted application at ArcGIS.com. It's really just the portal for ArcGIS installed centrally and offered in a SaaS model. You're seeing this across the industry too. Uh, Adobe, if you log in, you can now get an Adobe subscription and use all the software out of the, off their site. Uh, Microsoft 365, we use it with our business. Many others may have seen it. Uh, that is where you, you subscribe and you can use it all on a hosted server. You don't have to stand up servers on your own. Same concept here. If we define a portal though, and I think this is important, it's a web-based interface for users of enterprise mapping applications, what we all have, and or informational products that drives collaborative technology engagement via content sharing and peer integration. So a very long sentence there, but you'll see it picks up on a lot of the trends we've talked about so far today. How does it get there? What does WebGIS do? How do we embrace WebGIS? It's through a portal. And again, just to reiterate, it could be a software as a service, it could be installed locally. Don't get hung up on whether it's uppercase or lowercase portal, it's having a portal, an entry point to all these points in the data. The intent of the usage of it is exactly the same either way. So WebGIS is more than maps on the web. We often will say, hey, WebGIS, oh, I've got WebGIS. I've got ArcGIS server and we have a custom Silverlight web application that shows maps on the web. That is really awesome and it, and it has been a foundational concept getting to where we are today, but that is not what we're calling WebGIS of the future. Portal over and above a web map provides many things. It has ready to use content, the content we've published, authoritative content, 
has available content from the online data sources, Esri, the city, whatever. Has many applications, and we're talking lightweight applications, not necessarily ArcMap, that can consume that same data point and utilize, derive, build upon. And finally, and this is the key, hopefully it's coming back, system of engagement, a sharing model that allows users, and these are end users, not us only, to publish, catalog, derive and share content across the organization. So it's about taking the GIS out of this room and exposing it to the larger group. Systems of record, right, where we started with, what we probably have today, are brought together, they're cataloged, they're shared, they're consumed via a portal, which is what drives and creates the system of engagement. So you've got a system of record as your GIS, you've got a system of record as your customer database, your outage management database, every other database spreadsheet, I don't care what it is in your organization, any piece of data that's a system of record and authoritatively manages data. Bringing it together, overlaying it geospatially, providing the new relationships we talked about, allowing users to view, search, catalog, and share it on their own and derive, that is what creates the system of engagement. And I'm hoping this will come home because you're going to start hearing these terms more in the industry. And this is what it really means to us. Again, I said it's not specific to uh, the GIS community by any means. If you go out and search system of engagement, you'll find uh, many different charts and, and uh, application within IT in general. But we're really moving in these. You can see a lot of the common themes here too. Loosely structured, quick to adapt, conversational, dynamic and in flux, the edge of the business, and fundamentally social. This doesn't mean our social lives interacting necessarily with our business data, but it means creating a social aspect by engaging the end users to consume, derive, share our data products. So we get to this point and we say, well, we all know traditional GIS really well. It's where we've worked for a long time. The concept here, how do we get to WebGIS can be a, a little bit daunting sometimes, but they don't need to be. You know, you hear a lot of pitches from some folks that say, we need to do it all, we need to do it all now. From the top down, every user in the organization needs GIS. That's a pretty big, tall order if you're talking about a large organization or even a small organization. It doesn't happen overnight. So how can organizations take a first step, not all at once, with a portal? I've got sort of two questions to lay out that I want you guys to think about. I'll use utility examples, but I think they apply across to whatever your source of data is. Question one, how can we expose new data within the organization while leveraging the existing investment in GIS? You guys are here because you work with GIS, you've invested in it money, time, effort. You probably had to sell it upward in your organizations. We want to utilize that. We don't want to invalidate anything you've done to date, but we want to take it and expose it in new ways. So it starts with your ArcGIS server database. This is your authoritative data you have today. Taking that and exposing it directly with a portal instantaneously puts it onto all the devices. You can very quickly have it on the iPads, your phones, your Android devices, browsers. And it's not like you have to build custom applications anymore. It's lightweight apps that are out of the box. But then you turn and you think about your larger organization. What other data points like we talked about? Your other business databases, your spreadsheets and reports. I don't care what business you're in, you have these everywhere. Like we said earlier, almost every piece of data can be tied to the face of the earth. So why not take some of that data and expose it through a portal, reference it with your authoritative data, and you've got a brand new map product that did not exist yesterday, which will change the way you do business. Quick example of this. This is from Middle Tennessee Electric, just up the road outside of Nashville and Murfreesboro. First step, they said, hey, we want to take our data. We manage all this data in the back office. We want to put it on all the devices. We did a portal, exposed it that way instantaneously, great value. We then said, hey, we've got a business problem. We've got folks in the field that are working overnight. These are what they call troubleshooters. When a power goes out and they send somebody out to assess the problem in the field, they didn't have any information. If they, a transformer blew out, they said, oh, it must have been too small. Where in reality, there's a lot of reasons a transformer could fail. Gary up here is an engineer and could probably list 10 or 12 reasons a transformer could fail. But they didn't have information to make that decision making, so they just would always upsize it. Now they looked at that traditionally over 10 years, uh, statistically, and it was costing a lot of money upsizing the transformer every side. They said, we have this information, but we just don't have it accessible and usable in a way that makes sense to the users. 
So we were able to go and look at that integration, traditional GIS, to bring consumption data in, the peak usage that you all have in the summers when you run your AC and in the winters when you're running the heat, to bring that together. Roll that up to the transformers. But we didn't want to put all that level of detail down to the individuals in the field. We wanted it to be simple. This is back to the targeted application. It's all out of the box, though. So we're able to take this, we're able to visualize it on the map and show now with color coding, very simple thematic map so that now that troubleshooter pulls out, maybe it's even his personal phone, logs in, we know who he is, he's authorized, loads the map, uses his GPS to center himself, says, ah, oh, here's the transformer, can click on it and can see the statistical information about the load on that transformer for the last several summers and winters in all time. He now very quickly knows, ah, oh, this, this is another failure point, I can resize stay as is, I need upsize, downsize. It really can drive decision making very quickly. It was an easy focus component, but it's a good example of finding new data points, taking your traditional GIS data, combining it with yet another business database, and providing a focused, simple application to the users that can make business decisions off of it. So question two, getting beyond that. How can we collect and don't stop there, collect and empower the new data points within an organization. So collecting is pretty easy. Everybody collects some data from the field. This could be an inspection workflow. It could be a, a, a field uh, a survey. Think about even door-to-door -door canvassing, door-to-door -door sales. You're collecting information from the field that has geospatial context. You can do this all very easily and bring new data into the organization and cross-reference that with your authoritative data. And that's pretty cool, you'll find value there. But we always say don't stop there, you gotta find a way to empower it. Now you guys as the GIS professionals, geoprocessing, using buffering, using some statistics, using that data in some way spatially, integrating it to another system, right? Driving it to customer information, driving a new work order for follow-up. Or changing your workflow, inserting it so we dispatch a crew more quickly to respond to an issue. Whatever that case is, find a way to empower those points coming in from the field, and if you do this, this solution will sell itself to every level in your organization because you're changing business drivers and business value based on a very simple workflow. Quick example here, right at Memphis Light, Gas and Water. Uh, they did a pilot for replacing their meters. They were doing, I think, roughly 60,000 meters uh, in the field that they needed to change out electric, gas and water. They needed a way to capture this data. They have crews touching all these important points in the field and couldn't we collect some data from those points while we're there? So putting a simple app out on 50 iPhones into the hands of the crews, very simple to use and really got minimal training and easy user adoption. They could collect the GPS point on the map. Uh, they could collect some basic information about that point on the map, tying it back to customer records. And finally, they can take pictures. And that was really an interesting point because the pictures are something you can't do easily. So if we're going to touch all these meters in the field regardless, why not gather this information and take pictures? And one of the most valuable ones that I thought was when they have an electric meter disconnected from the house to take a picture of the socket on the side of the house while we're there. You might not have an immediate need for that, but now you can actually take that into the back office and drive all types of business value. Think about the case where there's an issue at a home. You can actually pull that up and review this data, including picture data of the actual facilities while sitting at your desk before sending your crew out. That saves money, increases efficiency, and changes the way you do business. So it's a great example of embracing it through collecting and empowering new data. We did a lot of reporting on this for management. We fed the data back to CIS through systems integration. Empower that data. So those are the two real patterns there. And if you sum it up, it's uh, empower, I'm sorry, it's uh, expose, collect, and empower. WebGIS provides the tools to do this. This doesn't have to be a hard thing, and that's what you're gonna see. The shift from the way we used to do applications like this used to be months or years, and now it's coming down to hours or days. It's a very quick turnaround on these. There's out-of-the-box applications that can drive this, that consume data from where? Well, you're probably guessing from a portal. So if your data is in a portal, these applications work day one. You drive new patterns for collecting, empowering, or exposing, they work day two. It's a really easy way to put the data into the hands of the folks in the field. Esri, in this case, releases these apps quarterly. You don't have to worry about it. It's not an IT headache because they come from the Apple store. They come from the Android store. Very simple approach. So the field workflows I just kind of talked about, those are usually quick wins if you're looking for a catalyst. And I often talk about use the concept of expose, collect, and empower as a catalyst to engage with platform because there are some system components to get it stood up, but that's the hard part. And it's not that hard. We're talking a couple weeks. We're not talking a month long or months of project work. 
get that stood up and then start using every pattern that goes from pattern two to pattern 1000 to engage new users within the context of geospatial data. So focus on the pattern exposed, collect and empower. It will take you to some new and exciting places. So WebGIS as a whole, it's shifting the focus from traditional GIS to the future of GIS. Client-server concept of having ArcMap connected to a server becomes web services and a web application. New ways to use that data. Standalone desktop, and this might include connecting to a database, but it's now a connected desktop. And this is now not just ArcMap. These are many different applications that are desktop apps connected in. Data models are still present. They drive the geo database, of course, but they become what we call web maps. Our users aren't going to care about what the database is if they know the data is authoritative. They care about the web map that they can use to consume the data. Static data moving to real-time data. We can have so many new feeds. Think about those trucks driving around the service territory that we can watch them on the map. Geo databases become geo information model. These are the web maps, the web scenes, et cetera, we build inside a portal. Our heavy custom applications that I have loved for so many years you know, they're changing into more configuration, more application templates, quicker to stand up, lower total cost of ownership, but greater business value at the same time. Generic apps become focused to single purpose applications. That troubleshooter in the field, he didn't need ArcMap. He needed an iPad with a map that told him exactly what he knew, which is not the same thing that another user in the field needed to know. Stand these up, but to do it easily and quickly, it's now possible. Proprietary data becomes open and shared GIS services. It doesn't mean you're taking your authoritative data and putting it on the internet for everybody to use at their heart's content. But within your authenticated organization to share your data so other users within your organization can use it, that's what we mean. The result of all of this, though, is that we're taking that system of record, managing authoritative data in a single location, and creating the system of engagement through WebGIS. So if I want to summarize and leave you sort of three points today that we've talked about and hopefully they're resonating now. Find your pattern. Expose, collect, and empower is a great way, I think, to think about it. But find your own pattern, whatever's going to drive it, and use it as a catalyst to get WebGIS installed, stood up via portal. It doesn't take that long. Get there and it'll drive the rest of it and enable you to start pursuing all these other concepts. Embrace the expansion of geospatial community within your organization. This is that social aspect. Uh, I got challenged by this by a, a similar talk I gave a few weeks ago. And a user said, you know, hey, if, if, if I put all this data out there and let everybody do this self-serve GIS, you know, my department's going to go away. It's going to decrease the importance of the GIS professionals. And I said, that's an interesting thought, but I think you've got it a little bit wrong. If you put this data out there and you are allowing this data to be consumed, utilized, embraced through your geospatial community within your organization, it actually raises the importance of the GIS groups within the organization. Why? Because you've enabled that success. You're going to be able to turn around, able to turn around and provide so many more targeted data points, maps, web applications, mobile applications that weren't, you weren't able to do before. So your volume is going to go way up. The support's not really that much more though, but it increases and elevates the position of us as the GIS professionals within the organization because we're the ones that are bringing that change to the organization. The flip side of that is they said, well, if you do a thousand of these, I'm gonna need a staff of 20 to support this. And if you talk to some of the largest organizations in our country who have done this, the support has not gone up. Because it's simple, because it's out of the box, it's a configuration aspect, and you're not building huge custom applications. I'm not saying go to a thousand tomorrow, but you can try a few, see how it works out for you guys in your application, your organization, and build upon that. I'm hoping you'll come back and tell me you found it to be true. And finally, in our world of Esri, using the Esri platform to transform GIS into a system of engagement. It can foundationally change the way you do business, change the way you interact, not just with GIS, but with other components across your entire organization. And I can't do anything but tell you that the ones that we've seen that have embraced these concepts are in a much better place. It's going to provide the foundation for the next 10, 15, 20 years of geospatial engagement, which is still GIS based, but a system of engagement is a far reached but very powerful thing to have in place versus the system of record we have today. And I think you'll see that change as we go through this, starting from where we are today and where you end up in five or 10 years. 
So with that, I thank you guys so much for having me today. I hope you found this uh, informational and, and uh, I hope that you guys will start to embrace a system of engagement. Take the small steps, but get there. It will really change the way you guys do business and the way that GIS is perceived and used within your organizations. And I'll be around the, the rest of today and this evening. I'd love to hear your stories too. It's my favorite part of my job is, is learning about how you guys are doing this in your organizations today. So uh, please introduce yourself. I'd love to say hello. And thank you very much.